Ring the Bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Katie Greifeld and Matt Miller. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio originals, and those folks streaming on YouTube. Interesting day here in the markets, guys. Basically camped out right now around the highs of the day. And we're going to hit some pretty interesting milestones should these gains hold. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're well uh, over 20% now above the uh, 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 the lows we hit in October. We're now higher than the August blip that we saw last year. Um, and we've erased almost all the gains since the Federal Reserve started hiking interest rates in March of 2022. So all the declines. Uh, we've erased all the declines, I should say. Almost. I think we have about 40 points to go. But um, Basically, um, it's looking pretty good, and uh, retail investors seem more bullish than bearish. Um, so the question is, are, are we off to the races, or is this just a bear market rally? Also, remember about the rotation that we were talking about out of big tech into small caps, et cetera. Uh, that's not holding today. It's interesting to see uh, the NASDAQ 100, that big tech heavyweight benchmark really off to the races. I think it's safe to say 1.7% on this Monday is pretty dominant in terms of performance. Yeah, but that's not to say that small caps aren't getting a little bit of love. You are seeing people pile into them and the conversations we've been having with folks the last couple of days is, you know, perhaps they're so beaten down that they do offer some kind of value at this point. All right, as we get the closing bells uh, here on this Monday afternoon, an extension of the rally that we saw last week. And in fact, I guess you could say this is a bit stronger maybe than what we saw last week as well here. A Dow Jones Industrial Average looks like it's going to finish the day higher by more than 190 points or about six tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 higher by about 40 points or nine tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq composite higher by about one and a half percent here on the day. We should point out the Nasdaq remains in oversold, overbought conditions. The S&P 500 right now on the precipice of overbought conditions itself here. And let's take a quick check at the Russell 2000, the small cap stocks that Scarlett was just talking about, closing out the day higher by four tenths of a percent. And wow, I'm looking at just some of the big uh, gainers in these markets. It really is about the IT trade, of course. Apple um, adding the most points to the S&P 500. Tesla on a tear up again. I think it's now 12 days in a row. But if you look at the breakdown, you can see that IT, the biggest winners in the uh, S&P 500, up more than 2%. Consumer discretionary uh, uh, stocks, uh, uh, which Tesla is one, also up 1.7%. Uh, and the only losers, really, energy is the only big loser. You had financials and utilities down, but not by much. All right. We just wanted to bring your attention to a story that just crossed the Bloomberg. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, tomorrow will be uh, casting international financial institutions as uh, counterweights, American-aligned counterweights to China's growing influence in the developing world. Uh, basically, she's looking to get congressional support for U.S. financial backing to the likes of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, saying that this is a way to push back against China's growing influence. Uh, yeah. This is something that, of course, uh, a lot of Republicans don't favor, more funding for these organizations. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I think the underlying sentiment they may favor, but necessarily, not necessarily the mechanism, uh, as you mentioned there, with uh, using relying on the IMF and the World uh, Bank. Uh, let's get, uh, I believe, uh, to uh, Michael McKee, our Bloomberg International Economics correspondent, joining us right now to try to make a little bit more sense of this, Mike. I know this is basically ahead of our testimony here, but how significant is this declaration? It's not particularly significant. It's aimed more at the U.S. political side than the international economy. Yellen would like to have the World Bank do more uh, projects that involve threats like climate change and pandemics, things that cross borders. And uh, Republicans are not, as, uh, as Scarlett said, are not particularly enamored of that idea. Yellen is trying to put this into a box of uh, us versus China yeah. in terms of lending to gather support for uh, the administration's position. Uh, the Chinese, of course, have the Belt and Road Initiative, which has uh, lent uh, billions of dollars uh, to countries around the world, developing countries around the world. Some of those now are unable to pay it back. So the administration senses an opportunity to maybe get back into the game and uh, raise the profile of the IMF and World Bank. And looking at this text again, uh, the secretary said that basically they serve as an important counterweight to non-transparent, unsustainable lending from others like 
China. Of course, this is Secretary Janet Yellen. Mike, that seems fairly political. That's a political statement. Is, is it unusual to see Secretary Yellen make statements such as that? <clears throat> no, they've, uh, the administration has been very fo forward in saying that it is, they are, we are engaged in an economic competition with China, not that we are enemies, but that uh, we are competing, and the U.S. needs to do what it can to stay ahead. One of the things that's certain to come up tomorrow is the administration's proposals for additional sanctions, trade sanctions, against China, particularly in terms of uh, sensitive technologies like microchips. And uh, Yellen will face some stern questions about that. We know that Patrick McHenry, the uh, chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, thinks that the, the administration's proposals don't go far enough. So that'll probably be the more interesting part of the hearing uh, beyond the IMF and World Bank. Mike McKee, thank you so much. Bloomberg's uh, international economics correspondent, Michael McKee, with the latest here on um, what Janet Yellen is likely to say when she speaks before the House Financial Services Committee tomorrow with regards to the IMF and the World Bank and how they would serve as counterweights uh, to China's growing influence. Matt? Yeah, interesting uh, political news there. And, of course, it plays on the story that China um, has taken a huge share of um, the developing world's uh, needs. And, and, and now um, we want to kind of get get back into that uh, game, take a little bit more market share for, for, for the U.S., or at least that's what the, uh, the Biden administration wants to do. I, I would, t just to get back to the markets, point out that Apple is now trading at a record high. It closed up 1.6 percent at the bell, trading for $183.79 a share. So um, that's a company that's currently worth uh, about $2.9 trillion. Ah, Oracle just came out. All right, let's get right to earnings. Uh, coming out of Oracle right now here, these are their fiscal fourth quarter numbers here. Revenue coming in at about $13.8 billion, a smidge higher than the average of street estimates, which was looking for about $13.72. Adjusted EPS at $1.67. That's a pretty meaningful beat. The street was looking for $1.58. Operating income coming in slightly higher than estimates. Operating margin slightly lower than estimates here. And a quick read here on their cloud services and licenses support business, a business that a lot of people pay attention to. 23% growth year over year, $9.37 billion in revenue. Still fishing around here uh, for any sort of uh, outlook here. But right now, you see the shares slightly higher in after hours trading. You know, the first thing that I did when I pulled up <clears throat> the statement of uh, its earnings is to look for any kind of uh, commentary on AI or artificial intelligence. And so far, I don't see it. So they're not going to say anything on that, at least in this press release. But it'll probably be a topic of conversation, Katie, uh, during the conference call. Oh, big time. And if you look at the stock right now, uh, it's up about 1%. Uh, of course, it's toggling a little bit between gains and losses as uh, traders parse through these numbers. But we know that part of the reason for Oracle's run up just in the past month or so is those AI enthusiasm, optimistic comments that we've seen from analysts. I mean, just today, Oracle but, got another upgrade. Yeah, but that upgrade was based on someone else's product, too. I mean, there's been a lot of concerns here about whether they have any organic products to really fill that void. And I guess it's great when you uh, the partnership that they have with Cohere, you can sell those products there. But the idea uh, that if they don't necessarily have something baked into the company themselves, why would you pick Oracle over one of its competitors? You know what? Let me correct myself because uh, Larry Ellison did say something about generative AI. Oracle's Gen 2 cloud has quickly become the number one choice for running generative AI workloads. And he goes on to talk about how efficient they are, low cost, and all of that. So, and they also mentioned NVIDIA. So, you know, if uh, it's word association at this point, right? Well, Given yeah. that NVIDIA is one of the best performing AI related stocks. Well, and they, if they say our strategic cloud businesses are getting bigger, um, I think cloud now is also kind of a synonym for AI, right? Mm. That's where all the AI is going to be done, uh, not just for NVIDIA's chips, but also for Oracle software. Exactly, and uh, it's going to be interesting to hear, of course, analysts actually get to ask these company executives questions. And, Romaine, to your point uh, on that upgrade, that was from Wolf, uh, basically analysts saying that it sees the company's plans to use Cohere to sell large language models right. as a solid second option to Microsoft's open AI partnership. So this is already a very crowded market. It's very crowded, and there's a big difference between that partnership with open AI, primarily ownership, and, and more importantly, the idea that Microsoft had actually developed its own product products prior to this. So it'll be interesting to see how Oracle moves deeper in that space. And I think Matt said it uh, perfectly there that cloud is basically AI. It's all synonymous now. You just throw it all into the basket and mix it up and hopefully investors love it.
And Oracle share is now a touch lower. We're going to continue to follow that story. But, but they that closed at an all-time high, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not too bad. That's not too bad. But that does it for now for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. Uh, and a reminder that Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place.